everybody is welcomed once again to this platform whereby we normally have this monthly um, seminar series. At the end of every month, we normally come up with presentations from different, different people all over the world. And we are very grateful for today because we have another presenter for us to also educate us from his field of study. Um, this person is in the name of Dr. Caleb Mensa, who is currently a lecturer at the University of um, Natural Science in um, Sunyani Yune. Um, he is a PhD holder in bio um, climatology from the Czech Republic, and he holds an M field in meteorology and climate science. Dr. Caleb has an interest in terrestrial echo system and atmospheric um, exchange in carbon dioxide, water, and then energy from um, the flux next, and then also the and tropical climatology and then numerical weather prediction and modeling. He is really an expert in this particular field. And he's here to present to us on the topic, um, the role of the Ghanaian tropical forest in um, greenhouse gas exchange and then carbon um, sequestration. Um, without much ado, I am going to on share my screen and then allow um, Dr. Halep to um, get onto the platform. Okay, thank you, Mr. Uzwansa. And um, before I begin, I would just like to um, thank everybody here for finding time to um, form your busy schedule to join us for this presentation. And um, I would also want to also thank the organizers for this program for really giving me, for giving me the opportunity to also share something on what we are currently doing as a university, um, as, a, as a way of we contributing to the climate change talks. And then also, I would also like to um, extend my gratitude to the university management uh, for their support. Uh, since this project started from the um, started in 2017, um, they've they've really been very supportive, and then to also um, the, uh, which is uh, held especially with regard to our international partners, that's Czech Globe, how they are how they've been observing these the role that forests are really playing in carbon sequestration, how this is done, and. Later, we just look at some results from some studies that have been conducted uh, with me inclusive, and then to see how some of these things were done, have been done elsewhere, and how we can also copy that same um, research and then also make it our own and also study more about forests, know more about how our forests are behaving, and then if they are being a source or they are really being active, sink. Um, systems and this that I would like to talk about. So to begin with, um, I'm sure we all know how recent, due to the recent growth in economic activities and industrialization since the 1950s, now we can see how um, there have been an imbalance in um, in the in the in the in these greenhouse gases sources how we are uh, emitting more of these greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and how they are also being absorbed. That's this imbalance between the sources and sinks. Now, we, we are now in a, in a part of the, uh, we, are, we are at a time whereby we are now even having around 410 parts per million uh, amount of even carbon that is, that is being recorded recently and this all to, uh, let us know that um, we know the impact when these gases are increasing the area they tend to now increase the greenhouse gas effects 
and then thereby causing leading to what we are now faced with as with the global warming and because and when there is this global warming it is leading to these catastrophic storms and hurricanes that we've been seeing around coastal flooding there are a lot of drought activities that are ongoing and uh, farming and a whole lot of insecurity that is also created so this has called for a collective um uh, like the, uh, the efforts from global uh, countries are now coming together to find a way whereby we can mitigate or we can reduce the amount of the, these greenhouse gases that we are uh, putting into the atmosphere. And one of these ways whereby we have much control has been with the uh, biosphere, that's especially with respect to forests, whereby we can increase and um, we grow more trees, afforestation, whereby they can, these trees can really help in the absorption or sequestration of, of carbon dioxide or other greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. And as I've already explained, as we see, um, so this is why afforestation is at the heart of most climate change mitigation programs. And that is even one of the core functions of the um, IPCC working group three, whereby they have to always find ways that we can mitigate some of these, um, some of these, um, these greenhouse gases and make sure mitigate the effects of climate change. And that's why recently there was this conference in Glasgow, that's the COP20, uh, COP26, whereby uh, the whole world met at Glasgow and decided on the way forward. And from these discussions, it was seen that we have to really invest more in afforestation programs. And this is the main reason why we are also concerned about how our forests, especially in Ghana, can also play major role. We know they are already playing major role, but how can we protect these forests? How can we know more? What are the factors, abiotic, biotic stress factors that are really affecting them? And these are some of the reasons why uh, these topics are very important for us to discuss also on this topic. So to begin with, as we all know, uh, through photosynthesis, trees are able to absorb a lot of um, carbon from the atmosphere. And as they absorb, at least we, we, we tend to also, they tend to reduce the atmosphere's carbon dioxide content. And these are some of the things, but however, recently we've been seeing that because we also, due to urbanization, the rate of urbanization, we also want to clear more spaces to at least get place whereby we can um, construct buildings, construct roofs and everything. So we tend to now cut down these trees who would have been efficient uh, sequesters of this atmospheric carbon. And when we cut them, now it is also going to now, uh, instead of they rather behaving as some form of sink, they also tend to now die and then they, and then later, they also emit most of this carbon into the atmosphere, increasing the, um, the greenhouse effects as I explained earlier on. So um, most of this um, carbon is actually stored, as you can see from this chart, you can see that most of this carbon is actually stored in the above ground biomass, some of, uh, around 44% of it. However, some of uh, about 45% of them is actually stored in the soil organic matter. And all of these comprise of the forest system. And we can see how efficient they really absorb, especially with regard to the soil organic uh, matter, the part of it, and then also to the above ground uh, biomass. And these are very important for us to know. Now, to have a look at the global picture and see forests around. Um, globally, we have forests spread all around the world. But as we can see from this chart, we can see that tropical or subtropical forests are really uh, playing a key role, a significant role when it comes to carbon sequestration, uh, possibly due to suitable uh, atmospheric conditions. We are able, our forests 
are very efficient when it comes to absorbing most of these uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. However, um, there is the worry that much research hasn't been done on uh, to see how uh, what factors are really affecting the sequestration capacity. Now we all just go onto the, um, there are programs whereby we all have to go for tree planting. Do we even know which tree species are really absorbing more carbon than the other? Or which tree species, um, or what climatic conditions with these warming conditions that we are currently facing, how is it really affecting the, 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 the sequestration capacity of this uh, forest? And this is why there, there is the need for more of such research to be done. I picked this um, news item online. And as we can see, there is the also global concern that even though our tropical forests are really playing a key role due to now the rapid rate of deforestation and other conditions, we are seeing that now these tropical forests as we saw from the previous uh, chat, telling us that they are really increasing, they are really helping absorb the carbon. They are now losing, even losing their capacity to absorb carbon. And this is a source of worry. Since um, 2010, uh, uh, this research that was conducted by uh, some scientists from the University of Leeds has revealed that we are really in for a lot of trouble as uh, since 2010, we have lost the, these tropical forests have lost about 33% of the ability to absorb carbon due to this, as I said, the high rate of deforestation that goes on. Also the warming or the higher temperatures and the frequent occurrence and severity in drought is also slowing the growth of these four forest trees and also killing them, which will counter the effect that even though the atmospheric carbon is increasing and these trees might be able to absorb this carbon to be efficient. However, these uh, abiotic stress factors are really going to affect them. That's why there is a need for us to also continually monitor, especially on the ground, uh, direct measurements to know how these forests are being affected by the drought and what could be done to also save this forest and make sure that they continue to play that significant role in the global carbon cycle that they actually play. Now, um, why then is there the need for the direct measurement? Direct measurement because it has been seen from a lot of studies that even though we are facing the, the challenges, most ecosystems are being impacted by drought and other conditions as a result of climate change. Some ecosystems or some sites are responding better to even this harsh effect or the stress, while some are, are not even able to withstand the harsh conditions. That's why there is a need for point stations, for, uh, point measurements to really know which forests are really adapting well to the climate, uh, to the impact of climate, and which ones are also showing resilience to some of these extreme climatic conditions. And there are different ways or methods that are being used to monitor this and to study how these trees are really uh, playing a key role in this cycle. There, are, there is a modeling method there is a remote sensing or ground truthing. I think the modeling method was um, uh, discussed further or explained further by Dr. Otulabi when he also gave a presentation about how they use the JULES, the UK JULES model. I think that was in the sixth session of this uh, virtual seminar where he explained extensively about how in the UK they've also been using some of these models to study um, some of these, uh, the sequestration capacity of this forest. And then also there is a remote sense and that is also mostly widely used. Um, now there is the NDV, either the normalized uh, um, vegetative index, whereby we they use that one to also monitor the rate at which these forest trees are absorbing. However, there are, as we know, with remote sensing, the, the limitation when there are clouds, when there are other 
uh, atmospheric conditions, they might limit the accuracy or the um, the the uh, how quality the the data might be. That's why there is a need for also ground measurement to also complement the remote sensing uh, data that we also get. So that's why there is a there is also the inventory analysis of carbon pools. However, some of these ground measurements are some way destructive in their nature. Why do I say destructive? Because some of these you have to cut down the trees before you can really assess and know how much carbon that was stored in that particular tree. But in this method uh, that I want to explain or I want to, the, uh, I, I would like us to discuss is on this eddy covariance method, which is a non-destructive method whereby there will not be the need for us to cut down any tree before we can know the amount of carbon that it is able to really sequester or absorb from the atmosphere. And it works basically on the turbulent transport within the mixed the mixed layer or the of the atmospheric boundary layer and then uh, as you can see mostly uh, there is a tower that is mounted in the middle of the forest and then the height of this tower should actually be around 1.5 of the average height of the trees within the forest why 1.5 because we really want to get the sensor that that will be that can capture these measurements within the mixing layer when it is so close to the surface of the forest obviously due to the roughness of the surface we are not going to get very extensive results from the forest or from the other trees but actually we will get something very limited from maybe one or two trees. And that's not what we want to get because in a tropical forest, there are diverse species of, uh, there are diverse tree species that we would want to study of them all. And as we know, uh, when the wind flow across the surface of the forest trees due to the roughness, um, there is some friction and that tends to uh, break these wind flow or the wind uh, creating wind share in the wind flow and as it also breaks this it causes and due to also sorry due to the uh, diurnal variations within the forest um also that uh, there are temperature change uh, differences that will be going on so it's also going to affect the rate of mixing and as it mixes on uh, within the atmosphere it's going to carry the amount of carbon that be present on uh, on top of the of the forest at that particular time, and as these um, wind flows towards the sensor, it captures the amount of carbon that might be within uh, the atmosphere at that particular time. So we tend to now measure if it is reducing, if the atmospheric concentration of carbon is either reducing or increasing at some specific time based on the atmospheric condition, then we are able to study and know, okay, in time of drought, this was how the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide over the forest at that particular time was. Then we are able to now know what is really happening to the sequestration capacity or the rate of photosynthesis that goes on within the forest at that particular time. So, that is what the eddy covariance through the eddy covariance method. Um, it enables us to really monitor how these gases are exchanged within the um, within the forest system and then the atmosphere. And then we so it helps us to gain information on how active the trees are really uh, being in terms of the rate of photosynthesis and how they are absorbing and what is really going on. Should they now should there, should there be limitation to the photosynthesis uh, to the photosynthetic ability that goes on within the for, within the forest at that particular time and through this as i explained earlier we are able to know how extreme weather conditions are affecting our trees as you can see from the picture below there um with, within the temperate um for them because they have the winter whereby most of their forest trees are shed. You can see that at times 
some of these atmospheric conditions really affect the way that the forest behave at certain uh, particular time within the year, months within the year. And one advantage, uh, the other advantages of the edit covariance method is that, as I, as I said, the non-destructive method, and it's really, it's able to cover over a very large uh, forest cover, and at least we are able to receive much data, and it takes data actually every 30 minutes, we are able to sample data. So we so within a year, you can get a lot of um, data readings, which you can analyze and know at each hour or um, time what was really going on. And one of uh, the disadvantages that it depends actually on this, one. though the power consumption may be low, every time it requires power. So for you to actually even start the eddy covariance method, you have you need to extend electricity to these remote sites, especially within the forest, and it really costs a lot. And these are the disadvantages with the method. However, uh, it has a lot of advantages. And since these advantages outweigh the disadvantages, it is one of the best methods being used so far. So across the world, as we can see from this chart, you can see that a lot of sites are now using this edico variance. However, they are concentrated mostly over the, the North America, European region, Australia, and um, other places within the Amazon forest. There are also edico variance sites there. However, when you come to Africa, you can see we don't have a lot of this measurement going on. Even though, as we say, we confidently say that our tropical forests are playing a key role, we are not studying so much about how, even the rate at which they are absorbing, what are the conditions that are affecting their capacity to absorb. And that is why this project was uh, came to uh, mind. And that is what the university, in partnership with our Czech partners, are really embarking on. And um, later uh, within the um, pre presentation, I'll show you what work has been done so far at the project site and what we seek to also achieve very soon. So I would like to also show you, as I've been mentioned, that we have some foreign partners, which are from the Czech Republic. And there's a map of, of, the, of the Czechs. And as we can see, they have a lot of these stations spread across their country, and they are really active in studying and understanding how they are, uh, how their forests and even their agricultural uh, lands are also um, assisting in this carbon sequestration. And one thing that I nearly left out is that the eddy covariance method is not only used over forest sites but it can also even be used within cities. It can also be used even within agricultural lands. And now um, we, we in Ghana, we have actually started and we will actually be using it over the forest sites. So these are some of the sites spread that are spread across their country. And as I was saying, there is an agroecosystem site or station. There's also the grassland, they have also one agro uh, ecosystem in Vietnam. And then there are also some in the wetlands. So regardless of actually where you belong to, you can really use this uh, eddy covariance uh, system to really monitor the greenhouse gas fluxes. And as we can also see from this angle here, that's the tropical forest, which we will be talking more about later as I continue with the presentation. So on top of the tower, as I said, the one in Ghana is, will be as tall as 70 meters, whereby we are going to get these sensors installed on. And these are the sensors that are the sonic anemometer and then the infrared gas analyzer. 
So based on the wind movement and the data that the wind will carry into this census, we are, this gas analyzer is able to capture the amount of carbon that is uh, present within the atmosphere at that particular time. And it's run through some tubes whereby it, it will now run to a monitor. And then there'll be some an analysis done within the equipment. And then we are able to register and know how much carbon is being uh, is present within the atmosphere at that particular time. And alongside uh, the sensors that will be measuring the carbon, there are also other meteorological sensors that are also mounted alongside. And the, uh, as, you, as you can see from here, there is a Fino camera that will monitor even the color of the, the, the color of the forest cover to know how they are changing color with the seasons. And based on that, we can know that, okay, when our forests are having this color, are they really sequestering a lot? However, in our part of the world, it doesn't change much because we have the evergreen forest. And then we also have the rain gauge, there's the air pressure sensors mounted. And there's, that's the, we also have the uh, air temperature and humidity sensors also measured on, uh, measured on the tower. We also have, and actually the air temperature and humidity sensors, they are actually uh, placed at different heights on the tower. So that at every height, we are able to know how the temperature, the temperature profile within the forest system. And then we also have some paranometer for measure, uh, and then we, we, and then the net radiometer, all of them to measure the radiation. That's we, there will be some to measure the short wave radiation being received from the sun. And then we also measure the long wave radiation that is actually being also emitted from the surface or within the forest canopy. And we are able to now uh, study and know how even with terms of radiation is even affecting the sequestration capacity of our forest. So as I pro promised you earlier on, I said I'll show you some results from some previous studies that have been already conducted. Actually, this was conducted in the temperate forest. And actually, um, the focus of the study was to know the site-specific environmental factors that really affected the, the amount of carbon that was being absorbed by the forest. And, in simple terms, that is what uh, we actually refer to as the gross primary production. That's the amount of carbon that the forest receives at that particular time. So um, to help us achieve this, we actually conducted the study from uh, May to September of 2012 to 2016. That's we used data for this period to actually um, determine and know at which point in time was um, sequestration maximum. And if there was reduction, was it due to some specific environmental conditions that was uh, causing the reduction in the, in the intake of this carbon, uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere? And then later we also uh, checked to see how even severe droughts and other uh, extreme weather conditions could also affect uh, the GPP, that is the gross primary production. And they, for this study, we only studied using two tree species within the temperate zone, which are beech and the spruce species. So uh, the initial results that we uh, got was that first we needed to analyze and know um, during which time was carbon absorption high within the forest. And obviously it was during the summer that we could see that because there are suitable conditions that photosynthesis can take place, that was when we were actually getting the peak, that's the potential, the maximum um, GPP or the maximum carbon uptake within the particular, within the year. And we used the, the summer period because we didn't want uh, the season, the winter or the other part of the, se uh, of the season where obviously we know the GPP will reduce. We didn't want it to affect our data, but we really wanted within a very uh, near perfect condition, how will the carbon sequestration be? 
And that's why we actually limited our study to only May and September, which is the active time when they are mostly in their summer. And this are for this results are for three different stations. And that is uh, one of their stations in a mountainous uh, part in called uh, one of the three sites that's uh, Blixish, that's uh, what is shown as BKF here. And then we also had, we also have the for rice where it is shown as the RAJ. And then there's the Stettner, that's the STN. And these are different sites. Actually, the first two sites are the, those sites with the spruce forest uh, tree species. And then the Stettner has the beech uh, tree species. So we wanted to actually know how these two different tree species are really responding to some of these site conditions in their absorption rates. And for the years, we saw that 2015 really had low um, GPP or low carbon uptake because the, there was a drought during that time. So the uh, absorption rate was very low. Uh, however, for, um, for the station as, at also uh, the Belixish site, that's the BKF, we saw that um, the conditions, atmospheric conditions there are very conducive because it is on a mountainous path. So, mo so mostly the weather there is very humid and then there is a lot of water supply to the tree species. So we were expecting, so it comes as no surprise that actually the, the GPP, they have higher GPP as compared to the same tree species site at the RAJ, that's the rice. So, and then for the Stettina, that also, that was just for us to compare with how the different tree species were behaving. So the, on the left are the atmospheric conditions. And as you can see from here, the, and as I was explaining, the station at Belixish, that's the BK, was very, was uh, humid as compared to the station at Rice and other stations. But the station at Rice was on a lower plane. So it was rather characterized by a moderate dry climate as compared to the other sites. So we will get to see what was really going on. So to help us really um, come out with this analysis, we have to now, sorry. We have to now use the random forest some statistical analysis to know at the particular sites which of the environmental conditions was affecting the carbon uptake process within this forest site. And we saw that uh, as ca can be seen from the environmental variables of importance, we can see that for all the three sites, radiation, that is the photosynthetic available radiation, that is uh, seen as PAR, was the more was uh, the dominant um, factor that was affecting all of them. Then later we have the vapor pressure deficit that was affecting, especially for the first two sites, which are characterized by the tree, uh, which has the tree, the, the spruce tree species. We saw that the VPD, that's the vapor pressure deficit, was really having an impact on the rate at which they were taking the carbon as compared to the one, the beech tree species at the Stettner, that's the last one there. And all of, uh, for all of these, um, we were able to know that this, between these two tree species, we saw that the spruce tree species had really um, a tighter stomata response. That's to say that the, um, with the lit, they really reacted to the meteorological drought or, the, or when there was uh, some dryness within the atmosphere, immediately we had a response from the spruce tree species as compared to um, the beech forest or the beech tree species. This shows that this was because actually the tree species has a very shallow root as compared to the beech. Which, uh, which has a very deep root system that is able to really um, go very deep into the soil and have access to uh, soil moisture as compared to the spruce, which has a very shallow one. And as such, because of this shallowness, it were, we, saw, uh, we saw that 
when during the 2015 drought, they are they were the tree, the spruce tree species was severely affected by drought as compared to the beech tree species, which were uh, depended or got assistance or support from the underground water. So even in times of severe drought, it was able to adjust and, um, and react or respond better as compared to the trees, uh, to the spruce tree species, as we also saw. And since radiation also played a key role, we saw that um, for the mountainous uh, sites, because of its orientation, to, um, to uh, because of its or orientation and how the sun could shine through it, it, it performed even better under even cloudy conditions, which shouldn't be the case as compared to the other forest sites. Under cloudy conditions, there was less carbon uh, being taken or there was less GPP. Um, but normally GPP was better during partial cloudy conditions. And these are all some of the site specific conditions that we saw. And as I was explaining earlier on, we now saw that since it's the spruce species that reacted more to drought, it was something we could now study further and see how this spruce, which is grown at different sites, were really being affected by the, uh, by the extreme drought uh, conditions in the summer of 2015. And as we can see from, this is what we call the light response curve. And we actually use the, um, uh, the, the Monteith light response curve, which uh, was actually is a equation by one scientist and for us to know how these tree species reacted or responded to the amount of radiation that was incident during this time period. And as we can see in the red color, the red lines are for those during the dry conditions and the one in black are for those during the wet conditions or the adjacent normal years. That was 2014 and 2016. And we saw that during the dry period, um, there was some reduction for this same tree species grown at different sites. However, the amount of reduction was drastic or was significant at the second station, which had a moderately drier climate as compared to the one at the mountainous, which was humid. So meaning during these dry stress conditions, even though the tree species, this spruce tree was really affected. However, based on the sites at where they were planted, one responded um, faster as compared to the one at the other sites. And this was just for us to know how uh, these the residuals from the GPP or from the carbon uptake were really responding to the vapor pressure deficit and soil moisture. Uh, this is a little complex whereby we used, um, we had to know the slope, the breakdown at which these uh, tree species really reacted under these extra, uh, higher uh, vapor pressure deficit conditions, and then also at a lower soil moisture that is uh, abbreviated by the um, volumetric soil water content, that's the SVWC. And based on that, we got to know that, especially at the station, at the dry part, there was uh, really, there was a sudden reaction uh, to the VPD or to the vapor pressure deficit as compared to the station in uh, Belichis or the mountainous humid uh, station. And this all shows that though with climate change, as drought is going to also, um, the occurrence of drought is going to be enhanced. We are also going to see that even though one specific tree species may respond or may react or may be affected in some way. However, even these tree species grown at different conditions may react differently. 
and also with the tree species too, there might be some difference between even the tree species on based on how they respond. And all of these the con to conclude with, we saw that uh, water management strategy will play a very key role under some of these conditions under which these trees might respond to the impact of climate change. And we saw that even though in 2015, uh, GPP was reduced, one tree species performed better than another tree species. And even for the same tree species grown at different sites, one which was in the, in the moderate dry climate even performed poorly as compared to the one which was in a humid climate. And these are all things to tell us that climate change indeed will have an effect on even the carbon uptake of these trees. So it's just not a done deal that we have to grow trees, they are going to absorb the carbon. These tree species, depending on their properties, are going to respond differently, especially under this warming climate that we find ourselves in. Um, I think I will just jump, I've already explained most of this already, so I'll just jump to the other um, analysis which I want to show. Recently, one of our uh, postgraduate students, that's uh, Mr. Clement Anaba, um, just conducted some study using some FlaxNet data from 2011 to 2014. FlaxNet is the community of um, scientists whereby those who are interested in monitoring carbon fluxes within the forest and the atmosphere. We have, there is a portal whereby they put all the data that has been gathered. Uh, over the years, around 2011, 2014, there was, an, there was a campaign that was started by some Italian scientists in, in the Ancasa forest in Ghana to also monitor using ethical variants to monitor, however, uh, to, sorry, to monitor the carbon fluxes. However, this experiment couldn't last for long. Uh, the project came to an end after 2014. So there was not enough data to really monitor. So Mr. Anaba actually used the uh, flux data, carbon flux data accessible at the FlaxNet site to make its analysis to also understand how our tropical forest is also behaving, especially with respect to the uh, tropical forest and their carbon sequestration capacity. And as we can see, we saw interestingly that rather during the dry period or the dry season, uh, we were seeing more carbon uptake during the dry period as compared to the wet period. And for the years, there was no actual, there was no data for 2013. So we only had data for 2011, 2012, and 2014. So this actually um, motivated us and we had much interest to really uh, study, study more and see how these, uh, what is really going on, especially for these two periods that we are now seeing the dry period rather absorbing more uh, carbon than the wet period. So for us to study, we have to now analyze some climatic factors and see how they were also affecting the GPP or the carbon uptake potential. And as we can see here, radiation was playing a key role. Interestingly, during the dry period, under very low light conditions even, we saw that uh, we were actually recording high GPP values, which is the forest was active in absorbing carbon. However, under high light conditions, possibly during the afternoon time, when there was a lot of sunshine, temperatures were high, obviously the GPP reduced because you know, the, with the plants, the plants taking the carbon through the stomata. And the stomata is the same way whereby water vapor or water is also exchanged between the plant and then the atmosphere. So as there is some kind of dryness within the atmosphere, the stomata will now open up, try to um, create some 
pressure within the plant system. And through that, it's able to actually pull water from the roots through, uh, from, the, from the soil through the roots. And then it's able to now transport itself upwards through certain mechanisms, which I wouldn't want to go much deeper, but just on a, um, just on a simple terms, it's able to now release some water vapor into the atmosphere and evaporation, evapotranspiration. And through that, we are, we are able uh, to also, the plants are able to also allow carbon to enter within the stomata. So we can see that under high light conditions during the dry period, we don't have the, uh, the, the tree or the, or the plants absorbing more carbon. However, the wet period under very high light conditions, they really did well. And this also can be seen that during the time of the day, and as we can see during the dry period, we are having more light conditions, possibly due to the less cloudiness that is caused. And then when we also check the soil water content with how GPP was also behaving, uh, we also got to know that even under a higher soil moisture content, there was a reduction in the carbon uptake, meaning this shows that, and the difference between this carbon uptake wasn't so much. This shows that under this forest system, possibly soil water content wasn't the main limiting factor for the carbon uptake here, but rather it was possibly with, there were other factors like radiation, that was also playing a key role. So we have to also check the evaporative fraction as can also be seen here. And we can still see that under light, under the same uh, reduced light conditions, there was somehow appreciable uh, evaporative fraction. Uh, there was, when evaporative fraction was around 0.6, that's um, midway of it, we still had high GPP being taken. So meaning as, there was this light conditions, there was evaporation, there was less, this light condition being caused by the less cloudiness during the dry period. We were having more of uh, carbon being sequestered as compared to the wet period. However, under higher conditions, under higher light conditions, that was when uh, we were having the, um, the wet, during the wet period, we were having the trees the trees rather absorbing more of the carbon. And, you, and we ask ourselves, how many of these conditions will persist during the wet period? That's why it comes as no surprise why in, the, in this pre previous chart that, that I showed that the trees were actually more efficient in absorbing the carbon during the dry period than during the wet period when we were actually expecting them to absorb even more carbon. All of these let us know or tell us or inform us about how these three species are responding under different climatic conditions. And we actually need to study more about uh, their potential and uh, to really absorb more carbon, especially under different climatic conditions, under warming climate, and how these Climb, uh, these forest trees can really show resilience in, um, in withstanding some of these droughts or uh, harsh climatic conditions. And this will also play a key role in helping us formulate very sustainable national policies that can really protect our forests. Since now the international community and everywhere across the globe, they are looking at Tropical countries like Ghana also playing a key role in some of these afforestation programs. So what is now UNER's role or what is UNER now doing? UNER is now, have now cited a station at within the middle part of Ghana, that's within the Ahafo region of Ghana. And with this station that we have actually cited, um, we are hoping to get very interesting results since it is within the transition zone or the transition belt of Ghana. The previous result I showed was within the moist or uh, within the moist 
forest part of Ghana. But now we are going to get studies that are really going to give us about a mixture of these moist uh, conditions and the dry conditions to the north because of its uh, location within that part of Ghana. And these are some pictures uh, of how uh, we started with the project when we went into the site to locate where the tower, where we were going to mount our tower. And as you can see here, this is Professor Michal Marek. He is the director of, uh, of the institute we are partnering with in the Czech Republic. And these are some, and this is Professor Imos Kabuba. And there are other um, workers from the Earth Observation Research Innovation Center. Yorick in UNE, where we visited the site to really see where the best conditions, because for any covariance, we had to consider a surface where it is very flat, not very, um, very rough um, uh, surface, forest surface. So at least it will not have an impact with the, with the turbulent exchanges that we will be expecting. Then we also, these are also other pictures of where we actually mounted the site when we found a very perfect or a very uh, good place to mount the tower. And we also received support from the university management to mount this tower in the forest. And as you can see, this is the tower in the heart in the middle of the forest reserve. And this forest reserve belongs to the Forestry Research Institute of Ghana, Forec. And these are the shelters which are going to contain the, set, the monitors and other things that we, uh, the computers and everything that we will use for our analysis. And this is the 70 meter tower that has been mounted within the forest. During the visits, uh, the foreign partners, we held most um, some workshops to educate the, the university community or to sensitize them on, uh, on the project that was going to be done. And there have also been other outreach programs that we've done to the communities around to also let them know uh, of the project and then the importance or the significance of this project to Ghana as a whole and how it is really going to play a key role. As uh, we now want to really quantify and know how much carbon our forest trees are really sequestering is very important. And these are some of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Thomas A.J. and other colleagues. We participated in uh, even educating the students. And these are some students from UNE, and these are from the community where the carbon tower or the carbon flux tower was mounted. And this is just a short video to show you how, uh, what work had gone on so far. This is the footpath to the forest. And this is where we had the tower situated. And very soon, actually the site will soon be opened for us all for measurement to take. And as you can see, we are really, it's, it's going to be a very, pro, uh, a very promising site as we have a very dense uh, tree cover. So we are expecting very interesting results to also know how this forest site within the transitional belt is going to really help us. We are also even receiving, we are now in partnership with uh, some uh, with Lancaster Environmental Center in the UK to see how best they can also monitor other, um, other uh, biological uh, volatile organic compounds, that's other greenhouse gases. Uh, how these forest trees are also active in also absorbing some of this. And this is also being led by Dr. Frederick Otuladi and his team from the UK. And they too will also be starting such research to also study the forest and know how they are also really behaving with regard to that. And these are some of the sensors. I just wanted to show you some of the sensors that will be mounted on top of this tower. We have actually received these sensors in Ghana and they are housed now at the university and they will soon be deployed to the site to be installed.
and all of these thanks to the university management and everybody involved. So thank you. And we are open for more collaboration, people who want to learn more about the tropical African, the African tropical forest and know how uh, it is really being active in, in the carbon sequestration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mesa. It's so really interesting the um, presentation you have made right now and how I wish this could be you know, spread out throughout the whole country, especially in the mining sites where Galancy is really destroying our forest. Um, I believe people have a number of questions that they would want to answer. So you can either raise up your hand or probably you could type in the text section. You can type a question so that you can um, be identified and then um, it will be read out and then Dr. Mensa is ready to um, give any answer to any question that will be posed. So um, the floor is open for questions. I hope I wasn't too complex <laughs> in my explanation. I try to keep it very simple. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think there's a raised hand. Um, that's okay. the um, Russian University of um, Hydrology, and then y yes. yes. Uh, so you, you can you can go ahead with the question. Okay. Um, for the first time, I'm going to uh, tell you that. Uh, oh, first, my name is uh, Mami Magini Topa. I'm from Guinea, Guinea Conakry. So I'm here for BSD. Oh. Oh. Like uh, I have written. So uh, I think, like you can see, uh, my English is not very well. So you have to, I have to present my <laughs> excuse. Okay. No All problem. Right. So uh, and. Ask you to be more attention because uh, my English is uh, not very good. Okay, mm -hmm. but I have a uh, uh, to thanks to give a big thanks to our eminent uh, doctor for his uh, lecture. And I have uh, a question for the topic. Uh, can you please? Uh, uh, Say uh, or explain at which uh, which speed the CO two is uh, sequestrating our uh, African uh, tropical forest, uh, especially in Ghana. Uh, can I repeat? Because <laughs> yeah, I think it's clear. Um, he he can come. Let me tell the second question. You can add. Yes. <laughs> And the second question is, uh, uh, in your story, I have heard that you say uh, it was a specially asked on September, that, or the month of September. September. Yes. Ah, so OK. That is, that is done, yes. But I, I no, OK, I understood. I wanted to, to know that uh, in which period of the year uh, 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 forest, uh, our forests are uh, more secreted by, are uh, more affected by uh, CO2. Okay. But okay. you, you, no, you already said that you asked only on September. Okay. No problem. Okay. So thank you. All right. So, Doc, about you. Okay. So, um, he wanted to actually know the rate of uh, carbon sequestration within the Ghanaian tropical <coughs> forest. And um, that is what actually the whole, that's the focus of this research. At least we want to really know. We know that there are annual and, seas and seasonal variations. So in order for us to even know the rate at which these trees are really sequestering carbon, or they are really absorbing, we will need to know all those factors that are really affecting them. Okay, so uh, the research is actually about to start. 
And based on that, we can really determine some of these uh, key or critical questions that will help us to really understand. And if you uh, can remember, let me show you from the previous, uh, from within the presentation, I was showing you that even the carbon flux data that was collected um, at, at the former Edicovarian site in Ghana, you can see that there were, there were annual variations. And even within the variations, annual variations too, there were also seasonal variations. All of these need to be taken into account if we really want to know the direct, uh, if we really want to measure and know that direct rate at which these trees are being sequestered. And that's why I said all of these studies will really help us to really understand some of these things and know, especially even what is causing these variations. We need to know. So that when we go out to plant those trees and to make sure that we are absorbing the carbon, how are uh, we just don't go home and sleep, but at least we know how some of these things are. When it is, uh, some of these things are going to affect the the growth rates. It's going to affect the sequestration capacity, and all of these are to be taken into account. And then we know uh, the best times to even plant them. And maybe when we are reporting, we know that in this year there was drought. So obviously, our maybe carbon sequestration reports that we have to give, it's going to reduce. And if it is reducing, and uh, uh, how much is it reducing? I don't know if that answers that first part of your question. Yes, yes. Okay. All right, all right. And then for the second uh, aspect, you wanted to know why in that previous study we used the May to September. Uh, I explained that the reason why we use the May to September is that, you know, in the temperate forest, there have been a lot of studies that have already uh, taken place within the temperate forest for them to know which part of their seasons, really there is a lot of carbon being absorbed. And when they check uh, and from studies and from literature, we get to know that it is during the summer, especially from spring and summer, when you know there is now radiation, uh, uh, there is a there is a you know the the sun the virtual um, uh, migration uh, is it yeah the virtual migration of the sun whereby now from around March we have a lot of um, sunshine now setting in and now there, there is a spring and now their plants start to do well so from that time from the spring period to the um, to the summer that is where they really sequester where whereby they are trees sequester a lot of carbon so in order for us to really know and to uh, reduce the influence of whereby we are going to have a drop in the GPP we didn't want to have that one affecting our data because we were going to know what climatic conditions are really affecting the carbon take within this forest. Already, if you add the winter and you add the spring and the autumn, those climatic conditions are also going to affect so that when you see low GPP, you might mistake in it that possibly uh, there might be some conditions that are happening there that is affecting the GPP to drop. So we had to look at uh, near normal conditions. And at those times when their trees are really sequestering a lot of carbon, which other climatic conditions, which other specific site conditions can really have an impact on even that carbon uptake period. And, be, and that was why we made, we limited our study to only cover some part of the spring in May and then all the way to the summer period. Uh, that's the end possibly when the summer would have uh, come to an uh, abrupt and that's why we used uh, the May to September. All right, thank you, Dr. Caleb. Um, I think there's a question also coming from the, uh, the text section, but before then, um, there's a hand raised also from um, RSHU. So could you also ask your question before I read the question in text? Yes, um, thank you very much. Um, this is Vincent from the International Department of RSHU. 
Yes, I want to commend um, Dr. Caleb for this wonderful presentation. Yes, um, because our forest reserves, is, it has been a problem for our country over a period of years now. Now, um, my question is simple. I don't have much knowledge in the climatological sector, but um, from my understanding, water vapor is also a contributing factor to this global warming. And as increasing, for instance, our forest reserve, maybe planting more trees and other things, wouldn't that also increase evaporation where we are going to release a lot of water vapor into the atmosphere? Thereby, it's like we are changing, um, getting carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and releasing other sort of um, maybe elements that is also going to increase this, um, contribute to global warming. And my second question is also this. Um, like I said, this is a wonderful um, project that you have, but um, concerning its implementation, because in Ghana, we have a situation where Galamse is like our um, um, economic factors, okay, clashes with this, uh, our scientific and other areas that we have to do to make our country better. So concerning its implementation, do you think it is possible to implement what you are presenting to us right now, looking at the, the Galamse aspect as it's being the main source of income for our country, for some of them, of course. Do you think it can be implemented? Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, so yes, uh, as you made mention about the water vapor, yes, um, we also be, water vapor is also a very important uh, greenhouse gas that will also, uh, be monitored. Actually, when I was explaining with the ethical variance, I made mention that not only the carbon flux are we measuring, but there will be other energy fluxes that res with respect to uh, even the latent heat, the sensible heat and other things that you know, this all also play some uh, role or have some impact on some of these um, gases, the, the, uh, the exchange of these gases. And as you rightly explained, um, there will be there is evapotranspiration that goes on within within these trees, and obviously they will be emitting some uh, water vapor into the environment, and that is when actually uh, we have this carbon also being uptaken because when the stomata open up, it is able to when these gas cells around the stomata help it to open up, it's able to also take in this carbon. Yes, but you know, as you said, I will not worry that carbon, that water vapor too is another uh, main greenhouse gas of our concern. The main reason why carbon is actually, uh, should I say widely studied or uh, we normally consider is because of the lifetime. You know, for you to take even one carbon from the atmosphere, it's about, it takes a period. It has a lifetime of about around 100 years, 100 and, uh, 10 years. But for water vapor, it just takes some few uh, minutes, days, it will form clouds and we have rains. So uh, as such, mostly uh, it is still steady because it's a very important greenhouse gas. Uh, and I can even say the, the, the abundant greenhouse gas, but mostly because of its lifetime, just a matter of just few days, uh, minutes, days, uh, people don't normally talk much about it, but it's it's a very important greenhouse gas, as you say. And then with with respect to the implementation process and how Galamse is going to affect it, even I would even want to even add one more thing, not even only Galamse, even the deforestation. Now we are even having a problem around our site whereby there are a lot of concession now being given. Uh, given to people to now go and cut down the trees. These same trees we are hoping to study and then learn more about. We are having the case whereby the, there is high rate of deforestation. I read in a news item whereby Ghana is also ranked alongside with Brazil when it comes to this some of these deforestation rates. And these are all going to affect, have some in, uh, impact on our study. However, lucky for us, we are, our station is actually situated within a forest reserve, whereby it is um, the reserve that is being managed by the Forestry Research Institute of Ghana. So that one is a protected virgin forest. So at least that's the good news with our, uh, with, with our project that is being protected. 
However, when you are, as I was saying, when you are moving onto the site and you look around and you see how their trees are being cut, it's so saddening. And we, you tend to ask yourself a lot of questions. But for now, uh, this is why some of these projects are important to really uh, draw government's attention that even though we need to cut some of these trees, but there should be some policies. How can even these young trees even absorb the even the trees that we say okay fine when we are cutting these old ones out down when we are cutting them down we are going to grow them how much carbon can they even absorb how much can these old trees even absorb this carbon all of these questions have not been um, uh, like we've not gotten the answers for them that's why some of these projects are very important to really know more about some of these. And I hope I've answered your question very well. All yes. right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, yeah. OK, so um, Dr. Zaleb, I think there's a question also in a text which says that um, that's coming from um, Famosa Dembele, saying that, Thank you very much, Doc, for your wonderful presentation. I would like to find out whether the eddy covariance can monitor other greenhouse gas, gases such as the CH4 and then N2O. So um, before before you can answer, I think there's also another person also who has raised the hand, but you answer this one first, then we attend to the Yes, question. please. Yeah. It's very true. Yes, as I said, the, the ethical virus uh, can measure other greenhouse gases. But for us, um, uh, for now, and it, it depends on the type of forest ecosystem, uh, ecosystem that you are going to monitor. Uh, for instance, in what... Uh, I showed you a picture of one of the forest sites uh, in the wetlands uh, in, in Vietnam. For them, you know, because it's a rice paddy field, there is going to be a lot of methane that is being released into the atmosphere. So we have an eddy covariance system there. That's the, our check partners. They have a station there that is monitoring the rate at which even methane is even being emitted into the atmosphere. And these are all uh, thanks to the eddy covariance system uh, that you are that helps you to monitor some of this. And as I explained earlier on too, it can even be used within cities to even monitor, even factories, some factories even mount them. But in this time, it will not be a tower. It is a tower because it is in a forest and the tree height is so high that it's, uh, you have to, you will need a tower to help it uh, hold the census family in place. However, there are other sensor, there are other ways that you can just put them on top of your building with the census there, and then it can still monitor the rate at which you are even emitting some of these greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So it can be used across a wide range of uh, ecosystems or maybe places, yes. Okay, so there is a hand raised that's from Isaac from Pondacom. So please could you unmute yourself too? Okay. Hello, Doctor. Uh, please. Uh, please, my question is uh, during the presentation, you made mention that. Uh, some trees have uh, carbon than the others, which means uh, is it uh, uh, carbon dioxide at different rates, uh, which absorbs carbon dioxide at different rates in the same place. Let's say we have trees, uh, let's say we are planting trees, but is it right to uh, plant uh, carbon dioxide? Um, I think I'm losing you there. Yeah, I think it, yeah, it's not so clear. It's breaking. That's why. Yeah, I don't know if he can maybe possibly type it or. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so so you can type your question, so it becomes very clear because um, when you were speaking, it was not very clear because of the um, network problem. Um, if any other has any question, I think you could also type in. I can see some commendations here uh, for for Junet. Yeah, 
So anyone who would want to study this kind of um, in, um, forest uh, carbon um, sequ uh, sequestration yeah. emission in Guinea, yeah, I think that person is also welcome. And I think this particular project is very, very, um, very good because um, over the transition region, I mean, that particular site you have cited is very, very good. So I'm thinking probably we could also get to other sections um, which have very dense forests within the country, the Western region. And that's these are the places where we have these galaxy sites. In fact, it's, it's a problem, but um, yes. really- So that was where, so that was where actually the, the former station was, the previous station. But because there was no uh, proper collaboration with the local partners, I think uh, it's, it couldn't stand for a long time. But you know, for you to understand some of these things very well, you need long-term measurements. And having some of these short-term measurements, which uh, Mr. Naba used, uh, wouldn't really help very well. That's why we need to collaborate more and we are calling for more collaborations. People who want to also come and study, we also want to create, uh, we have this opportunity for you to also come and um, come and study some of this thing more in UNE, Department of Atmospheric and Climate Sciences. <laughs> yeah, so I think um, Isaac has typed this question. He said, during the presentation, right. you made mention that some trees absorb carbon at different rates, which um, affect sequestration process. So is it right to plant trees which absorb carbon at different rates at the same place? That's his question. Okay. So, Mr. Frimpong, so as I was explaining, uh, all of this needs to, uh, we need to know. We need to know some of these things. That's why we are now um, embarking on this project. You know, our forest, we are blessed with diverse tree species. Unlike in the, in the temperate zones, whereby there could be only one tree species within the whole forest, okay? For us, we have diverse, diverse uh, sp tree, tree species. Within the, uh, within the forest. So we even need to know which, uh, there have also been other studies to know which trees are absorbing more because there is an inventory, forest inventory whereby we know which trees are absorbing more. But however, what is missing is that how are these current climatic effects, the warming, the drought, all of this, how is it really affecting the sequestration rate? How can we know? We can only know if we study some of these things. And that's why this project is there for us to really know the different rates at which they are absorbing under which climatic conditions, maybe under what uh, sites specific conditions, can they survive? Can they withstand some of these um, uh, some of these um, harsh conditions. And that is why we really need to know their resilience and how well they are, they are also doing. Yeah, so uh, we also have um, Dr. Jeffrey also has a question. He says that um, um, who can access the EC data from your station? And then are there any protocols to follow? Yes, please. So for uh, assessing the ethnic covariance data, we have, that's what I mentioned, that we have a FlaxNet, com, uh, a FlaxNet community of scientists whereby we report and then after we've collected the data, we make it available to the FlaxNet for them to um, place, put on their portal. Okay. Then actually some protocols. So normally if you want to access some FlaxNet data, you have to um, contact the main person in charge for the forest site. And they will give you some per some permission for you to get it downloaded, or possibly if they have, they can get it for you, for you. But I'm sure KUST, if we are also to have a collaboration, they too can also uh, access some of have access to some of this data. That's why we are calling for more collaboration from other institutes also, and even Ghana met you. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, and how are you also linking up with the? Um, a forestry commission, you know, in terms of the, this kind of data and then even possible EPA. EPA, yes, please. They've been very instrumental. Forestry commission, I, I must commend them. They've been very supporting. Um, they've, every time when 
we have to go to the site. They have guards even following us to help us, to support us. And they are even, they are our landlords. They actually give us the site. And with the, also with assistance from Forex. So they, have, uh, so they give us a site for us to even mount our tower and do everything there. So um, we have a very strong collaboration with them, MOU with them. And then we also, EPA, we are now, we have now started um, the, the efforts to get them involved because they are the main reporting um, body on these greenhouse gases emissions and absorption uh, rates to the, the UNFCCs. So we are hoping that we can finalize those um, agreements very soon. And we are hoping that in come November, we are hoping to open the site fully to start research, very uh, active research at the site. And we hope all of these bodies can come on board so that we can get enough data, we can get enough information to really advise our politicians. And at least it will also give us an upper hand, especially when we go for, you know, this carbon credit uh, funds negotiation. At least if we know how much our carbon, uh, how much uh, carbon our trees are sequestering, we can now know exact, we can get the exact figures. And then based on that, we can really have a very good bargaining uh, power when it comes to some of these things to seek for support money into our country to support some developmental projects and so on. Okay, so one final question, which we could um, end there. Um, it's coming from um, Famusa Dembele, who also says that, um, how can we make sure that the fluxes is not taking into account the emission from the surroundings of the forest, especially if there's a town or a factory which also emits these um, um, greenhouse gas? Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's a very good question. And that was why, let me show something from the slide. That was why when we were citing the station, we had to really go there. So if you see from this chart, um, you can see the station here is the one in red. We have to, and those around here, these light red lines are the road because we didn't want any interferences from the road side. We couldn't just go and mount the tower just close to the road. Otherwise the, the person, cars, those cars passing by and everything will just be emitting most of this uh, into our sensor for us to record as carbon. So we have to actually go very deep into the forest whereby, and we have to check our footprint. That's the wind directional flow to know how wide or how far our sensor can really measure the fluxes. So all of these were done. And then to also know uh, be before we agreed to now place the tower within about, and it's about uh, three, about almost two kilometers away from the road. And that is where our tower or our sensor is being placed so that we don't have any interference from the nearby uh, community or the roads, because we really want to get very accurate data from the forest and not from the community. Oh, all right. Um, thank you so much. I think we've spent much time um, and um, we are very grateful for Dr. Caleb um, for this wonderful presentation. And we believe that um, as time goes on, um, uh, we, will, we, will, we will really expand this particular project into various parts of the country to really help us also see on the world map and also contributing to mitigating this kind of like all right so and thank uh, you so much also for the opportunity thank you once again yeah so um we we want to take a picture um of the participants that um, um please could you uh, stop sharing so that we can now see and then take picture yeah even as we are switching on our camera we are going to have another um set of um presentation yeah that's next month we we have um uh, this presentation coming from um, a professor in Russia next next month. So I believe um, all of us will really um, hook onto this platform next time um, we, we call upon. And we are going to share a recording of the video of um, this, particular um, this particular presentation for everyone to also, you know, 
listen and listen over. And then if you have any contacts you want to make with our presenter, you could also contact him. Um, so please, can you turn on your video so that we can take a picture? It's very, very important for us, for us to, you know, um, take records of what we are doing. So kindly turn on your video. Okay, smile, one, two. <laughs> yeah, I believe people are really eager to show very nice, um, you know, <laughs> pictures. Yeah, so please, um, let's, let me take the, the last one. Um, okay, so the next one, so one, two, three. Thank you so much. We will be expecting you to connect um, um, onto this platform. We will send the emails um, respectively to all who really registered. So that's the reason why I was even asking us to also re-register on this platform to help us to be able to track um, people we can now add to our um, contacts. So next month, we are going to receive that particular presentation. So thank you very much for the um, um, connection and then listening to this particular um, presentation. We are very grateful and hope to see you next month. The same time, um, the last Thursday of um, October. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>